everything in baby's time, his early flight out. I got to say a little bit about that. So. And without any further ado, I will hand you off to Davey. All right, so um, <clears throat> this is a talk that is kind of actually a conglomeration of about five different other talks. I have no idea how long it's going to be. I have twice as many slides as I'm going to show you, so if you have questions about anything, <laughs> I probably already have slides on it. I'd be happy to kind of bring them up. Um, so this is PHP 5.new, the best bits. We're not recording. <laughs> I just thought if I went like this, now it's going to be weird. Um, so I am David Chaffick. Uh, I am a community uh, engineer here at Engineering, uh, which basically means that I go around to conferences and I give talks like this one. Uh, I write a lot of stuff on our blog, so if you read any PHP content on blog.engineering.com, I probably wrote it. Um, I'm the author of the Zen PHP 5 Certification Study Guide. I just finished the third revision. I'm waiting Yay. for edits. It should be out by ZenCon in October. Uh, also, PHP Master and PHP Anthology. Uh, I am a contributor to Zen Framework 1 and 2, PHP Docs, and I have one patch in internals, which means I can put it on the slide. Nice. <laughs> also, the original creator of Bar or PHP Archive. Uh, what that means is I came up with the idea and somebody who started writing. <laughs> uh, I'm a lead for PHP Women in the US, so if you're interested in PHP Women stuff, come talk to me. And I'm at DShafik on Twitter. We have a conference coming up Thursday, Friday of this week. If you would like to go, come and talk to me, and I will see if I can make it happen for you. It's um, at the, what the heck is that? Oh, it's a slide I started. Come on. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's at the, um, the Palace of Fine Arts. Uh, we have shuttles from my hotel on Park Avenue, whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, come talk to me you know, after this and we'll see if we can make it happen. Uh, one more thing, um, I'm hard of hearing, so please speak up. Everyone forgets this, and now I get to say this, I actually have hearing aids in for the first time today, so we'll see how that goes. Um, about my slides, I do something different than most speakers. I have a title slide like this, and behind it, I have bullet points that you won't see. I'll skip a slide, um, so don't worry. That's all it is. It's basically my speaker note. When you get it, uh, you know, go look at it online. All the bullet points, all the talking points will be there and nice and easy to read. Um, so that's all that's going on. For this talk, I decided to put a version indicator on every single slide so you know when it was introduced. Some things are in multiple versions, so you'll see something like that. Uh, my designers will probably kill me for doing this to their lovely slide deck, but uh, it works. So, <laughs> without further ado, PHP 5.3, released June 30th, 2009. That's like five years ago now, right? Uh, 5 to 15 percent faster. It's basically waiting for somebody say, to say it's end of life. So if you're not on 5.3 right now, you need to move past it, but there's a lot of cool stuff that was introduced, but it's the 6.0 that never happened. So, uh, eReg, uh, uh, regular expressions, deprecated. SPL is always enabled, reflection is always enabled, something called now doc, which is the same as here doc, but no variable, so it's like single quotes instead of double quotes. Uh, go to was added, so if you're writing state machines, that'll be useful to you. Uh, I put this one in here only because that's my patch, that's why I'm in internals, that function right there. Uh, extreme context set default. Um, three, well, two new magic methods were added, invoke, so if you have an invoke method defined on an object, you can basically do dollar object and then throw a pair of parentheses on it and call it like a function and it'll run this function inside of it. Call static, which will allow you to have um, call methods statically that don't really exist and it'll talk you through to call static. And then the call method was updated. Previously it would only work when the method didn't exist at all. Um, unlike get and set, which would also get called if whatever you were calling was private or protected. So call now works that way as well. Um, and as I already mentioned, keep performance in read. 5.4, I'm going to skip through like the small stuff for all the versions and then we'll go deeper into other stuff. Um, so it was released March 1st, 2012. Again, up to 15% faster than the previous release. So now we're talking a cumulative 30%, which is kind of incredible. Um, session handler interface was added. So if you've ever done a custom session handler, it's now way easier. PHP binary constant, which gives you the path to the PHP binary if you ever need it. Uh, notice now shown on array to string conversion. So it used to be that if you called an array in a string context, it would be turned into the string array. 
and there was no notice or warning or anything to be thrown, and we said, we have enough. And the Drupal guys wailed about this. They said, you broke all our tests. And the PHP guys went, no, your tests are wrong. What's happening is, and the reason they're passing, is it's converting your array that you're comparing to the string array and comparing it to another string array. It's not comparing the contents. Um, so your tests are actually wrong. And they went, oh, crap. Um, UTF-8 by default, so the um, card set header that gets sent, no UTF-8. This is one of my favorite things, array callbacks. So used to be with 5.3 and below, you could define a variable that had a string in it, and that string could be a function name, and then you could use all the variables, parentheses, and call the, the function. You could define callbacks using uh, arrays. So in this case, we've got an object and a method. In this case, we've got a class and a method, so this one's static. This one's an actual uh, object call. You could define those and you could call them with like call user func array, but you couldn't actually just throw the parentheses after it and call it. So now you can. Um, callable type hint has been added, which kind of ties into this. Um, where you can <coughs> define a class or an array as a type hint, now you can say callable. Anything that can be called could be passed in. So that can be a string, it can be an array, it can be a uh, closure can be a class with or an object with the invoke method defined. There's a whole bunch of things that can go in. Um, and again, memory and performance improvements. 5.5 five, uh, released June 20th, 2013. So this is the current stable <laughs> release. The slash E modifier for the for compatible regular expressions has been deprecated. That allows you to do valve stop to the regular expressions. That was a terrible thing. So hopefully you've never used it. Um, ext MySQL is now officially deprecated. Yay! Uh, they added bool valve, which is basically complementing in valve, float valve, double valve, string valve. So basically, it's the same as casting to a boolean using a boolean casting operator. JSON serializable interface. This one's kind of cool. If you implement it when you do JSON uh, serialize or unserialize, encode or decode, sorry, um, it will call that function, and whatever's returned is what actually gets serialized. So you can strip out private data or whatever. Um, minimize what's going out. Um, there's a new constant that is available on every single class called class that will give you the fully qualified name. So if you're using namespaces, you can just call whatever the name of the class is and it will give you the fully qualified name uh, using the double quotes class. That's case insensitive, by the way. Um, and which means it's not really a constant, it's some thing. But um, MT will now support any valid expression. If you ever wanted to go empty some function call, what's the result empty? You couldn't do it, you have to assign it to a variable first. They're coming for them. Jackson can say. Um, but you gotta sit in front, that's gonna be really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now it'll accept any valid expression, which is fantastic. Um, and then set error and exception handler, you can set to null, uh, and then we'll set it to the default, which is something we just didn't do before. Can you pop? Can you, can you push and pop this? Um, so if you, yes, so basically what gets returned is whatever was previously in there. So you can push a new one in, that will return what was previously defined, which could be null, um, and you can pass in null to go back to whatever, uh, back to the default, and it'll return your default. So there's only ever one, but you could easily put as many as possible in there. So 5.6, this is now at RC3, so this is what it was as of two days ago. Um, I expect this to be out within a month, so it'll definitely be out before the end of the year. Um, five six is the smallest release <laughs> since five three. Um, they've added the exponent operator, so now you can do power of stuff with the double stars. Um, yeah. uh, constant scalar expressions are kind of cool. I have like fifteen slides of that hidden somewhere, so if you want to see that, I can show you. It basically means, in a lot of contexts where you previously could not do basic um, expressions, so for example. Defining a property in a class, you could only do scalar values. Right. Now you can do things like math on scalar values. So long as it's static values going in, which includes constants that you previously defined, um, you can do that in those areas. So that's kind of cool. You can even do it in a function argument when you're defining it, which is terrible, but you can. Um, <laughs> another magic method, this double underscore debug info, uh, basically allows you to intercept var dump when you dump an object. So if you've got something like a resource that doesn't have anything but a stupid number that's associated with it, you can actually now do like a stream get info on it and return that as part of the var dump and be way more uh, useful to your developers. 
And then the GMP operator overloading, basically um, when you use the plus operator, for example, between two GMP objects or something, like add the object, not try to add, not try to cast them to numbers first. Um, so it's kind of a cool feature. It's something that's in Ruby where you can actually override what the operators do. Um, I want to see it come to user land, but so far uh, it hasn't, so we'll see. So, any questions on any of that stuff? Yes. Yes. Whatever you return as an array is what gets done. Um, I guess whatever you return actually is what gets done. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, and in fact, that might be one of the examples I have. Um, so, real quick, the GMP overloading allow for adding new operators? No, it's only the existing map operators. That's not a good place for the water. Um, any other questions? All right, so namespaces, this is a biggie. Better code organization. It was added in 5.3, it was enhanced in 5.6, so the newest release. Uh, it basically allows you to avoid naming collisions, alias, I hate reading this stuff, alias long names. It must be defined at the top of the file, unless you're doing multiple namespaces, you can never do that. Um, <coughs> relative namespaces are supported, so if you're inside of a namespace, and you want to rank with something else inside of the same namespace, or someone is caring for whatever, you can do it relatively. Uh, you import and you alias with the use keyword. This keyword is the now most used keyword in every part of the language. It comes into like five different features. Um, you can namespace classes, functions, and constants using the const keyword. Uh, that's also new that you can define constants using the const keyword in the global scope basically instead of using the define uh, function. Um, and it basically looks like this. So this is uh, sort of a, a script from uh, Zen framework. So namespace Zen HTTP client adapter. We're creating the socket class, which lives under that, so its full name is that string plus this. Implements these. Now these are relative to being inside this namespace. So this uh, interface is actually Zen HTTP client adapter, HTTP adapter, right? So because we're inside a namespace, everything here is relative to it. Uh, So this is now using namespaces. So what I've done here is this is a sort of contrived example, right? So we're inside the Zen namespace. Then I'm using our socket from earlier, but I want to call it HTTP client because that makes more sense in my context. I don't want to call it socket class. So when you use something, you can use the as keyword to alias it, which is cool. Um, and because we're inside the Zen namespace, there's actually multiple ways we can access this class that we've imported. We can do it using the relative from Zen namespace, so Zen HTTP client adapter socket, which would get this whole thing. We can use our alias, so new HTTP client, which allows us to shorten down stuff and make, especially if there's multiple implementations, you can kind of be more concrete about which one you use, or you can not care about which, which one you use, you just think of a name that makes more sense. So in this case, rather than being called the socket class, it's the HTTP client class, or we can use the fully qualified name, uh, which you can do for you. I try to always use qualified name, my IDE auto completes it. Like I can start typing the last part and it will fill in the whole thing, I use PG Storm, so that will always work. Um, 5.6 added the ability to also import functions and constants. So before you could define them in the namespaces, but you couldn't actually use them. Um, you, could, uh, you could only use them through the fully qualified name or you could alias out a smaller name, but it still had to be somewhat in um, so, it adds two new keyword sequences. So, before it was just use and then whatever it was, now it's use function and a, a namespace to a function, or use const and the path to a, a constant. You can use commas to import multiple of them, yes. Is this a good change? Yes. Why? It's a good change because otherwise, let me see if I can show you this, it won't help. Um, if you, so if you have a function that's inside of a namespace, which you could do before, um, so say we had the, um, uh, the bar function that's under the three namespace, right? The only way to access it before you have to use the fully qualified name. And when you do things like ESLs, uh, so name specific languages, you want it under a namespace because it makes sense to kind of clump it all together and not clash with other stuff, especially when a lot of keywords are very similar and they will clash. 
But when you actually use it, you want to shrink it down to a small fossil. And I'll show you that in an example here. Um, <coughs> you can skip to that one. So this is the BSL example. So everything's under the HTML namespace, and I got one function per tag. If I didn't have this change, I would have to use these names to access every single one of those functions that code would be twice as long. Okay. Um, I don't do much functional programming or procedural programming in this way. Um, so this doesn't really affect me. Uh, but it's definitely something that needs to be there. It's definitely something that needs to be there. Um, so using that, uh, it's very important to understand. So here we've got namespace foo bar, we've got a constant <laughs> hello world, and a function called str when. Right? So that would conflict with the global name commander, str when, which it does look at the inside of our namespace. Now I just call back to the root level because you know, it's an example. But uh, this, by the way, is how you do multiple namespaces in a file. You use curly brackets. This is the root namespace. So it's the little code. Again, don't do it. It's nasty, but for a slide it works. So use function foobar str length. <laughs> so we're importing this function. So it now is available in the root namespace, just a straight str length. It actually replaced the standard root implementation, at least within the context of this file, this file specific. Um, what's really important is, just like with classes, when you use a class that doesn't exist, it doesn't get imported right away. It doesn't get included. It doesn't even get checked. It's only when you later try to use that class that it actually does all the namespace and does all the aliases and stuff. Um, so it's the same thing with functions. You can use a function that doesn't exist. However, if you then try to actually call it, it doesn't fall through to the root namespace, it doesn't fall through to the default namespace. So for example, if strlen didn't exist and I tried to use it, it would then fatal error any, any time I tried to use strlen in that file. Um, so. That's the change of 5.6. Closures, one of my favorite new features, mostly because you can do really bad things with it. Um, so closures are great. So this is the most basic kind of form of closure. Any place in PHP where you have a callback, so something like you sort, now you can pass in not just the name of a function, you can actually pass in a closure, which is an anonymous function uh, that is, can be assigned to a variable or used as a callback. So I have an array, 3, 2, 5, 6, 1, I want to use use sort on it, so I'm going to pass in this simple function, which takes two arguments, does a comparison, and returns either zero if they're the same, or uh, if a is less than b, return minus one if it's more than one. Standard, simple sort. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what regular sort does. Here it is in callback. Um, what's important to understand is inside of this function, scope is completely you have no access to anything outside of the function. Unless you explicitly pass it in using the use construct. So here's another use of it. So the way that we do that is when we define our uh, anonymous function, so here we're assigning it to say hello variable. So say hello equals function use, and then the variable that we want to import from the parent scope or the defining scope. So in this case, it's a, please don't do this. Uh, we're taking the variable who and we're passing it in so it can be used inside of the function. Yes? If you bring things up, does it just affect my time? Uh, only if you do it by reference. You can use your reference. Um, and then we call it with the references. 5.4 makes some major changes to closure. Uh, and this is where the fun happens. So previously, um, when they first built closures, they didn't know what the heck to do with the dollar this variable. In PHP, the way that scope works, if you call any function uh, within a, an object and you reference all of this and you're inside some other object's scope, it would just use that object's bits. It's amazing. Um, I didn't know what to do with closures because you can pass them around and do all kinds of stuff. So before, this just didn't exist in the knowledge. That's the way it handled this. You know what? Just forget it. Know this. Know this. Um, uh, so what they did in 5.4 is they did early binding. So wherever you define the closure, if it's inside of an object scope, that's where this comes from. But you can change it. So this is something else that they added. So in 5.3, closures are actually, when you create a new closure, it creates an instance of the closure class, but that was just to get rid of implementation stuff. If you did a bar dump, you would see a closure object that got dumped. If you looked in the manual, though, it said, don't rely on this because it's just an implementation detail. <laughs> with 5.4, they went, you know what? Everyone's relying on it anyways, so we're going to do stuff with it. So they added a static method called bind or a uh, object method called bind2. They did the exact same thing, which is allow you to change what this points to and the 
the scope from which you are accessing it. Two different things, so we'll get to that. Um, <coughs> so, class foo, public function get closure. When you call this, it will just return a new uh, closure that returns this when you call this. In 5.3, we're inside of our class bar, public function construct, we instantiate foo, uh, we get our closure by calling this get closure method, and it's now in dollar $funk. We then call it, so this is then doing return this. In 5.3, it's null. In 5.4, it's foo, because that's where it's defined. So rebinding of dollar this or breaking the object model, I can only find one use for this and we'll get to that. Um, so basically it never changes the original closure, it always creates a duplicate, it always creates a clone, um, which is nice. Dollar, basically you can set dollar this to be any other object. And then you can change the scope to be any other object. So what that means is technically in 5.4 we've completely broken private and protected methods. Because you can always say, Dollar this is my class still, so at dollar this whatever will still call methods in my object. But the scope is some other object whose private stuff I want to access. So now I have access to this that's my scope. Um, so looking at this, what that means is we have our get closure, which returns our closure. In this case, we're echoing this hello and the result of the this world function, which don't exist inside of the foo class. We then create a class bar which does have our hello property, and it's public, and it has our world function, but it's private. So normally, and it's not extending, there's no extending going on here. Normally, uh, if that was a, an instance of bar, you wouldn't be able to access the world function. So, dollar foo equals new foo, we get our closure, we create an instance of bar, we take our original closure, we call the find to method on it, and pass in bar. So we said, Take this and replace it with this object, bar. And from that point on, anytime we access this inside of the closure, it really is actually this object, the bar. And then we call it. And we get this. So all we did was replace the object that dollar this points to. We didn't change the scope. So the context, the scope, is still the object to which it was defined. It just doesn't have access to the private method of world on the bar object. Instead, we have to pass it in twice. So find two, bar, and bar again. So we change this and we change the scope. Now we have access to all of the private and protected stuff inside of the bar uh, class. So this now will always refer to the bar class from the bar class and will actually work. And we get our hello world. What's the, what's the second thing again? The second what? Yes, the second parameter is scope. Um, any other questions on closures? All right. So traits is the big feature that I had in 5.4. Uh, really, it is compiler-assisted copy and paste. Uh, it is almost literally that. Uh, there is one case, which I can't even remember off the top of my head, where it's not that. Um, but basically, if you want to test what your, your trade is going to do, copy and paste it yourself, and it will do the same damn thing. Um, so it adds four new keywords. Uh, no, it doesn't. It adds two new keywords. Trait and instead of, and it reuses use and as, which are from namespaces and closures. You can use multiple traits within a single class. Um, and you use as and instead of to avoid conflicts. So if two traits define the same method, you can tell it to use one instead of another, or you can, and you can alias. Um, you can define methods, abstract methods, and properties within traits, um, and those will all be built into the class that uses it. And they can be namespaced, just like classes and functions and constants. So to define a trait looks a lot like defining a class. So namespace esutil, I told you we get to this. Um, we're going to call create a trait called secure debug info, and we're going to create a single method called debug info that takes this, casts it to an array, 
And then for each of the um, properties in it, it goes through and strips out anything that has an underscore because we assume that's private data that we don't want being done. Very simple. We then use the use keyword to pull it into our class. So anywhere where we want to use our secure debug info, we just use, use in this case, we're using HTTPS, util secure debug info, and that method is only available. Not even sure it is. It's literally just been copied and pasted by the compiler. It's sort of now available. <laughs> what that means is, is scope, this, parent, static, all those things, exactly the same. Uh, you can do sort of do inheritance in traits. Um, so we have two traits here, one and two. To inherit inside of a trait, we just use other traits inside of it. So you just provide traits of other traits um, instead of doing an extend. Um, when you are inheriting within the object model, the class model, traits also can kind of fall into that. So we create a class called numbers. We use our one trait adds a single method, this one here, so one, one. We then add two other methods, two and three, inside our class. If we then extend that with the more numbers and we use another trait, it adds another method, two, two, and it actually overrides this two here, exactly as if that function was defined by two. So you're just overriding it as if you were in the classes. We then define another public function one, which is overriding the first traits one. Um, but that came from the trait, not from the actual class, right? Now we have another class, even more numbers extend. More numbers, we're using three, which don't forget is comprised of the first two traits, right? So three one uh, overrides more numbers one, so this one here. Three two overs more, overrides more numbers two, which came from the two trait. And then um, we define our own, uh, sorry, three comes in as well, which uh, overrides this three. But then we define our own method here, which has the same name as something coming from the trait. Now, if you did that and did a literal copy and paste, and this is the one exception, uh, if you did a literal copy and paste, it says you can't have two methods with the same name in the class, right? With um, traits, it will just do it as if it were already there. Uh, so that's what's one. Are there notices thrown for all of this messy stuff? Going no. On? Oh, that's. It's exactly, it's exactly as if it were compiled and copy and paste. Like I said, if you want to know what the actual trait is doing, except for this one case where you're using a, a trait that has the same method that's defined in the same class, it is literally copy and paste. And you can do that yourself when you get that. Um, you can also specify requirements. That's where abstract functions come in. So when you specify an abstract function, you're saying when you use this trait, the class that you're using it in, or something that extends it, you could use it in an abstract class, for example, must define this function. So therefore, you can rely on that function within the trait. You can't do that with properties, though. Only methods. Um, conflict resolution. So there are conflicts. There can be conflicts. If you're using two traits, that have the same function in, at the same time. So it's not when you have a parent using it and then a child either using the same trait or one with a conflict. Uh, that would just be a regular inheritance override. Uh, so if you try to do that, it gives you this fatal error, which is the trait method or whatever the method name is not going to apply because there are collisions with other trait methods on class. Um, I love how it says it's not going to apply, like the you know, code can actually continue. Right? Uh, it is a fatal error. Um, but the way that we get around this is we use this instead of keyword. So use my security debug info, and maybe my framework also has a debug helper, and they both define our debug info method. So we add these curly brackets here on our use statement, and we say alias, so take this method here, and it's always a static uh, double colon there. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, static or not. Um, so use debug info instead of the one from this other trait. You can also use aliases, which is nice. So if you want to bring in two conflicting methods, you can use the instead of to get one of them as the original name, and then you can use as to 
to pull in the other one with an index. What that means is, if you know you're going to do this, uh, debug info from this trait could actually rely on this function here in this other trait to extend it. You can kind of get this weird extension thing going on, uh, even though it's all actually coming in the same class. Um, and that's kind of part of the horizontal review stuff. Um, you can also, if you don't use in setup, alias actually adds the name. Um, so if this part went away, and we just in, we did a use my framework uh, debug helper debug info as debug helper info, we would end up with both of the methods available. Um, it does not really do any of that. Um, the only case here where it doesn't do that is if we've already replaced it with something else. You can also change visibility because we've also broken out their model. Um, basically. Use whatever your trait is, my trait method as protected. You can just change the visibility. Uh, protected, private, public, you can go anywhere. Uh, with, um, you can also do aliases at the same time. So, my trait, my other method as private alias name. I'm not sure about this. I don't think it's a good idea, but it's there. If you want to, so, because traits are a compiler system optimization, you can't use instant cog to check if a trait is being used um, because it's not part of the object uh, heritage tree. So, instead, we have this class uses function. So, I've got class numbers uses one and two. If I've already done the class uses on the numbers class, it tells me with both keys and trees. Uh, What's cool about that is this is the only use that I can find for a ranking referencing that doesn't include the sub. Is you can do if class uses whatever the class name is, you reference off the trait name, you can then do some code based on what the last trait is. But don't do this. There's no guarantee of what those functions actually are or anything like that. It could be alias down the you don't know in terms of setting the private protected. Do not write conditional code around traits. It's possible, but it's terrible. Use interfaces. Hmm? Use interfaces for that. Yes, use interfaces. Now, if you use a trait, and it, it, you can actually use traits to fulfill interfaces. One of the things I love about ZF2, um, the service manager, there's an interface that says, hey, I want to implement the service manager. So if everyone does it exactly the same way, because they also build a trait that does that, you can just use the trait to fulfill the interface. Um, by five now, um, the finally keyword was added. So if you've ever used exceptions in another language, I'm pretty sure every other language has a finally keyword, um, it's now finally been added. So basically, we used to have the first part, so try and catch. Um, finally is an extra block that will always get executed when the stack is online. Um, what that means is, is if you have a fatal error or something like that, it's kind of like a destruct from an object for this try catch block, the way I kind of think about it. And it will always be called, regardless of whether or not an exception was thrown. Remember, this part is optional. So you could do a try finally and expect something else later up the stack to do the catch. So you can say try this, and when the whole stack has been unwound, make sure to close the database connection. And if an exception is thrown, I don't want to do um, so finally, is now simple password hashing. Yes.
next to the kind of fiber. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the bigger features we've added in 5.5 is simple password hashing. Um, the entire point of this is it makes password hashing super easy. The purpose of it is to make sure everyone uses safe password stores because how many sort of hacks have we heard of lately where they were storing the string strings or non-secure methods? Exactly. So it uses bcrypt currently, and I say currently because that's important. It is going to evolve. Um, salting is done automatically, so you don't have to think about it, but you can do it manually if you like. Um, the hash itself defines the algorithm, the salt, and any other options that were passed in. Uh, and you may pass an array. What did that say? Oh, as I said, you can specify the salt and the cost by yourself, so you can manually do it. Um, so what does this look like? Installer hash equals password hash testing password default. That second argument is the um, algorithm to use. So right now it's only supporting decrypt, but if in 5.7 they decide that, or maybe decrypt gets compromised, they decide to do away with decrypt, they will update password default to be whatever the latest, most secure thing is. So the next password that you cache after they make that update will get the next greatest Password verify, we pass the string stream from the user, string stream from the user, and the hash. That hash includes the um, algorithm that was used. So password default, we don't have to like store what type it was. It's in the hash. And password verify will use that same algorithm to verify. Uh, as I said, we can specify the options. So uh, we create an array with cost and the salt. I love this. Bcrypt uses 22 characters. It is 22 characters. Yeah. Um, and you just pass that in as a third option to password hash. Um, it also provides two helper functions, and this is, yes? No. Because the older hashes contain the algorithm that was used, when you verify it will use that algorithm to verify, and then the new one uses the new algorithm to verify. Now, two um, functions are added. This one is the most important. Password means rehash. When you pass a hash into that function, it will tell you, is it using the latest algorithm for password default? If it's not, then the next time they log in, you can check this and go, oh shit, they're not using the great latest greatest. Let's rehash their password because we have it right now because we're verifying it and store the new version. So you can kind of have a rolling update of password security. Now at some point, it's going to break down and they're going to go, oh crap, features has been compromised. So let's reset everybody's password. Um, but up until that point, this will allow you to just incrementally lower your password. Yes? What's the difference with options? Yes. So I, I have a slide on, on that. Okay. Sort of. Um, the higher, the better. Uh, 12 is free. Yeah. That's an empty code. It is. But that's good. Yeah. Well, it, well, you lock it in. Right. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, the other one is password get info, which basically returns all of that extra information that's in the hash, such as the salt and um, the algorithms and the cost. So a little bit more on password security. Um, the goal is to make both dictionary and brute force uh, attacks difficult. I actually also learned how timely attacks work in, in uh, Italy earlier this year from Rasmus. Does anyone know how a timely attack works? Here's how it works. I was so amazed by this. Right? So when you do string comparison, um, there's a what it will do is it will go character by character until it finds one that doesn't match. Right? So what you can do is you can measure how long it takes. Let's say it's a six-character string you put in. If it returns, I don't know what the numbers are, it doesn't like really say anything else anyway. But if the first character is right and the second character is wrong, you change the second character so it then gets slightly longer to the string, and then the next character will get longer and longer, and that's how you can get your Finding safe comparisons will take as long uh, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, so they basically will check every letter even if they find it wrong. That's, that's kind of cool. So um, a strong salt makes a dictionary attack much, much more difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult. Uh, a high cost means it takes a long time, so say one tenth of a second, uh, to generate a single password, uh, making it much, much less likely to be brute forcible. Um, the cost is what makes SHAR-1 and MD5 core algorithms for password attacks. Those two algorithms are meant for their feature mode, which means they're meant to be super 
super fast. But these are terrible in terms of password security because you can generate hundreds of millions of them really, really quickly and test our passwords against potential things like scripts. Um, additionally, MD5 also suffers from lots of privacy and stuff like that. Uh, so this is some hashing rates from this uh, source here. Um, MD5 on this guy's hardware, which is like two graphics cards connected to his custom uh, software, he can generate 180 billion hashes per second. He can test 180 billion different combination characters per second. SHA-1, less than half that, so it's 185% slower, 63 billion. SHA-512, we're getting a little better, we're now in the thousands here. But Bcrypt is only 71,000 per second. That's not that many. Yes. This is all what? It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. Right. Um, what that means is, tables. say again? But you can't do rainbow tables. You can't do rainbow tables, yes. Um, what that means is, this is all about reinforcing. Vcrypt is 253.5 million percent slower, which means it's going to take you that many millions of years longer to find the correct password. Now, this is on current, this is actually now about six months old. This is on consumer available hardware, right? This is how people can actually do it. So the lower this number, the better. This is where that cost factor comes in. I would say anywhere under a second is reasonable. Adding a second to your login screen in terms of like gaining an exponential amount of security, people aren't even going to notice it. So, 253.5 million times per second slower. Uh, Char 512 is only 412 percent slower, but that's still a big number. Uh, so, Bcrypt is the way to go right now. There's also PPKDF2 or something. Um, that was not chosen for this because they don't feel they need to secure it. Does that make sense? Get ready. Any questions on that? Pretty sure it might have been eight, but it wasn't like huge numbers. I remember thinking, you know what, I could actually afford that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 This is something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Six feet. So, um, generators is a big feature added in 5.5. Uh, it introduces one new keyword, deal. Uh, basically, what it means is um, it's a way of handing execution back and forth between an iterator and its iteration. Um, functions and met methods are automatically uh, turned into generators when the new keyword is used with them. So when you call the function, it doesn't actually call the function, it creates a new piece of the generator class and that is returned instead. So when you iterate, it will then execute through the function. Uh, it's basically a simple way to do generators. So if you've ever done a simple iterator, you've written a ton of boilerplate code, this basically makes it go away. And as I said, it's using the generator class, which right now is an implementation detail similar to the closure class in 5.3. See how long that lasts. So, I did this slide uh, on the slide over in this one. Um, function hello generator, so it's just a simple function. Uh, I'm pretty sure it could also be a method, but I've never done it this way. Um, greeting, hello, hi, different options. We use RAN. This is, I had slides on this as well. So they added um, the ability to uh, array directions on the result of functions in 5.4. In 5.5, they added the ability to do it on um, actual values. So you can do a straight array with another array with some complex array and get a random value or whatever. It's just that you don't have it. Why you would use that other than this particular case, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you can. You can also do it with strings, though. You can define a string, put the square brackets at the end, and get an individual character. So if you wanted to get a random character out of the string, now you don't need to assign it to a variable first. Um, it's in 5.4, though, right? 5.5. Mm -hmm. 5.4 added the array directing on function calls. So the result of function calls, this is on strings and arrays. Um, so we create our, our uh, random uh, reading. We then yield that reading, uh, which basically means at that point, uh, on the first iteration, we go through, we run through the tier, and the control is passed back and forth. Do I have time? No. Um, the next iteration will start here. So the function never runs all the way through at any one point. It's actually when you're doing a 
importance over this variable, the result of this function is assigned to, we'll see that here. Um, it's actually stepping through the function bit by bit. So the next iteration starts here, so we output a space, control is passed back to our forward uh, each. Third iteration starts here, and we actually use the uh, argument and the output you see first, and the new line, control is passed back to the forward. So what this looks like when we call it, generated equals hello generated, we pass in our argument, no code is executed in our function at that point. Literally nothing. Uh, all that happens is a generator is created, the object, and is assigned here. Then we for each over the generator as value, and we echo out the results of these yields um, as we iterate through. I got more slides on this. This is confusing as shit. Um, so <coughs> here's another generator. Um, what's cool about generators is you can throw loops have a while true inside of a generator that's not going to go off on an endless loop if you've got a yield inside of it. We'll get to why that's useful. So, first iteration starts the top of our generator, for i equals zero, i less than five, uh, yield i. So basically we'll iterate through five times. Um, I don't know why that's zero, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Oh, I have a four each missing on this slide, sorry. Uh, let me times it by five. Um, it basically will go through five times. Uh, and then the generator will continue iterating until one of three things happens. A return, which cannot have a value, so it has to be a flat return, basically. Um, no more yields are found, or an exception is thrown, maybe call. The only way to end the game. So, yeah, this is the one with all the errors. Um, we've got a simple generator, it straight through, no loops, no nothing. Echo one, yield two, echo three, yield four, echo five. We instantiate our generator, Start right here. The first thing that happens in a for each is we rewind this call. So we're basically going to manually loop through this so you can understand what that for each is doing. So rewind this call. When that happens, it actually is that's when it jumps into the generator. And it will run through until the beginning of the yield. So anything before the first yield is run at that point. So it will echo one at that point. Control is then passed back out of the function into the next. Bit of code. So if generated is this value, so it checks do we have something to iterate on. Um, it then calls current, which returns the next value or the current value in the iteration. So we're inside of our for each. So what we've done so far is for each whatever, we rewound, said is there anything to iterate? This is the as value part, that's what current is getting. Um, that jumps back into our iterator and runs the yield experience. So yield two. It then returns control back out of the generator. And we come back to our echo here. And it then takes the result of that yield and echoes it out. Next, it then calls for our next iteration. So we're now on the second part of our loop. It jumps back in right where it left off. And we'll then do the echo to stop at the yield. And then it would then do same thing as we did before, which is valid current. So it starts from here and do the yield. Um, so as I said, generators will return true for valid until one of three things. A return must not have a value. An exception is thrown or there are no more yields. You can also send data into a generator. You can do that. This is really cool. So you can send any data into a generator. Use it as a question rather than a statement. What that means is that you must put the yield and whatever follows it inside of parentheses. The limitation of the parser and the sentence of parentheses that will go away with some RSC generator. Um, you can send and receive at the same time. So, what that means is um, where we have this yield, we can also return stuff at the same time as we're passing stuff in. Um, so, if you're inside of a loop, Um, so this is a very simple generator uh, that has a while true in it, and is actually a log. So the idea here is you instantiate this log, and you pass in whatever file name you want to log stuff to. We open up the file handle, and then we have this while true that every time we do a send, we will jump into this and write to that file. It's very simple. So that that while true will not go off on an endless loop. It will never run anything until we. 
the first time I wrote the next slide, I got it wrong. And the second and third and fourth time I got it wrong. It was confusing as shit. I just wrote a chapter on this stuff and I still had to refer to it to write these slides. Um, I thought I found the bug, so I created the test case and while I was creating the test case, I realized what was happening. Um, I don't agree with it. I had conversations with some of the internal folks today and they're like, really, it does that? I'm like, yes, but I kind of see why, I just don't agree with it. Um, so I don't really think there's any reason why we fix the functionality, but let's head through it. So this is a slightly modified version of that logger where I wanted to output the date as part of that and I wanted to return uh, an incremental number so we know how many lines we've logged. Okay? Um, that's all we're doing here. We can use this file for content and for um, uh, FO good stuff. So I instantiate my generator. Do I have my. No. So we instantiate the generator. Um, we send in the first log line and we bar dump the return. So we bar dump whatever that number is. We then sleep for three seconds and we send in something else. I'm like, okay, we get two log ones in our log. This is what I got in my log file. And this is what confused me. I was like, hey, it worked. And then I saw this. They both have the same time. But there's a sleep time between them. That is not possible. How the hell did that happen? So here's how. This is the most confusing set of slides I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> and it's two slides, but it has like 80 arrows. So, we stand in our generator and we call set, right? So we're going to jump in here. That means we jump up into our generator. What's happening under the hood, you may need to wait for that thing. There's a lot of uh, What happens under the hood is our line gets called implicitly. So we run some of the stuff in here until we kind of get to the yield of the uh, we'll Fair enough. So, dollar i equals zero happens. We jump into the while loop. We start our file the contents expression. So we call my date, which goes down here. We jump back up for the rest of the expression, so we complete this uh, expression here. So we yield out our number, we add the uh, space, and we add a new line. We finish our file of contents. But then we start the loop again. And we continue that loop, calling my date again. Until we get back to the deal. And that is the point where the computer is handed back down here. So, what that means is the second Monday, the second uh, instance of this expression happening, actually runs on the first send. So, there's no more than a millisecond between them, no more than a second, so they're never the same date for both. They said it ends up coming back down to here. Sorry, you want that back? <coughs> These are actually separate images as well. The slide deck is like 80 minutes. So. <laughs> I got a close now. All right, so um, the second iteration, we go down to our sleep three, so we wait three seconds, and then we call send again. We jump right back up to where we left off the deal. So we've already called my date, and we complete this expression of adding the uh, space and the new line. Back up to the top of the loop, call my date again, go back to my date, go back out, go back to the yield, and that is when the controller is handed back. What that means is if you do a third send, that one is now three seconds off, but it's actually the time of when this one was called. So the second uh, I have, I did manage to catch it where it was four seconds off, which was, you know, tiny. That was a big effort. Um, it's confusing. Basically, just make sure that like everything happens after the yield expression, <laughs> and it should work how you expect it to. Um, yeah. Generators are nice. I don't think they'll lose that much. Yes. No, because I'm showing you the right. No, I don't like that. I don't like that. 
Um, Yeah, you can't return because the generator then is done. Uh, you also can't rewind the generator a second time. But it seems like building inside of the function column is where you figure out the yield. If I have done the yield above the file of the function, then the file of the function is not executed on that instance. Which means I have to log another line to actually store the first line of log. If I put the yield afterwards, I can't put the data that's in. One other thing you can do is, yes. Yes, but one line. Yeah, yeah. and you have an empty log. And then it's weird. I don't know. I don't like it. Could you do a uh, dollar sign log text equals yield to I plus at the top of it? This, by the way, is why I didn't put the cup. Um, so one more thing you can do is you can send exceptions in the generator. Um, so basically the exception happens at the point of the yield. Uh, the actual yield is obviously not returned by the report. What that means is, is we can have code that is an actual, uh, if we were to throw it into a forest, it's supposed to actually be in the loop. Um, but if we instead do a uh, exception, this method will accept because uh, it can fail out of it uh, at any time. So, we create a generator, we have to allow foo, then we have this try catch block, so any gener any exception that is not handled inside of the generator will handle the generator. So if you handle it, you can do you want. Um, so inside of our trial, we have this while true, yield back. It's right. Um, if an exception is thrown from that yield, then we're going to echo out the exception message. Uh, because there is no further yield, because this while is inside the true and we've broken out of it and done it to cache. Um, this uh, method actually ends. It'll run through the echo and it'll have an implicit return at the end and that's the end of the generator. Um, so instantiate the generator. We call current, uh, which echoes out foo and dumps the string back because we're only using some other code in the for each. Um, so we go through one iteration of the while true. We then use gen throw. So this is the function for throwing in our exception. You can throw in any exception if you like. Um, of course, this has to be able to pass it, right? Um, so you just pass the exception in. It basically goes back in this yield is run. That's where the exception happens. Um, would go into the, uh, the catch. So we echo out the exception test and uh, bar. Because we continue on the function and it is um, at that point valid with any default. So that's why we do the same. Any questions? Um, so, like I said, for the first thing that I showed you, uh, it's kind of nice. This is the kind of standard iteration of the iterator that uh, the boilerplate code is going to run at night. When you get full of these two things, you want to be very careful. Uh, but certainly, as a person who's been iterating the app for nine for a while, it's a little bit more precise. Um, I actually have, I can show you, I have a code example where I have um, a generate table function, and it's actually a, um, a generator, so I do four each. Yes. Um, Is that the key? Uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, now see what you've done. There we go. All right. So here's my table generator. Um, basically, if uh, data is not an object, 
uh, and it's not an array, then we're going to bail out. So if you get past something that's completely random, it'll never for each. Uh, the first thing that we do is we yield the table tag. So on the first iteration of our for each, we don't actually deal with the data that was passed in. We just create our open table tag. Then inside of our iterator, we have a for each that goes over the data that was passed in. We create a row, and then for each of the columns, we create a column. Um, so basically, every iteration uh, from that point on will be getting this yield, which is the whole row of data. And then the last iteration, because that for each will end when the data ends, will just yield the close table. So this is now a piece of Instead of using file put content using uh, f gets, right? We're doing it line by line. Um, so that's what that allows me to do. Uh, encapsulation, simple. Uh, I quite like that. And here's what it actually looks like. So table generator is our data set. So each row has three values. Um, and uh, that'll create the generator. And then to actually output that table, we just do for each in the row and just echo out the result. Um, I can actually run this. If I can remember how to do that here. Uh, for some reason, my PHP takes forever to load. I can't figure out why. Um, so there's the markup for the Do you know what? Okay, good. Yeah. I've, I've been looking at it. If I have it in my path, even, it kills my problem. Um, so, there's that. I do have another case for generators. Um, and this one is actually the, um, the sending stuff. Um, so this is a chat client. So I created this connect function that has a yield in it, so it's a generator. So you can do it in this as method. Um, and the way this actually looks when you call it is chat client connect, chat send, and you're actually sending stuff into the generator and it uh, sends it to the socket. Um, so anyways, back to the slides. I didn't have that prepared. Though. Um, <laughs> very add functions, the large feature type thing. How are we on time? Okay, so very add functions. This is one of two large features in Byte 6. Probably my favorite feature that's been added in Byte 2. Um, it adds this syntax dot 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 dollar bit. And what it allows you to do, so PHP is pretty much all of it, and PHP 4 allows you to pass as many parameters. problem with it was twofold. Uh, func get args would also pull in all of the defined arguments. Um, I always wish they just added a parameter to that because a lot of them they don't do that, so they never did. I probably should have done it. The other thing that um, is wrong with them is they're not documented. You can't read the code and figure out what the heck it's doing. Um, so what this does is it, it's an explicit variable that becomes an array that contains any extra parameters that are passed in and only so, very added means to accept the variable number of arguments. As I said previously, we need to use func num args, func get args. New syntax, triple dot, dollar variable. Uh, it's an array with variable arguments, self documenting. It supports by reference, which we could not do before. Um, it also supports typing. So, you can say every single value that gets passed into the very added has to be of a specific type, which is cool. So, maybe it's a whole bunch of products. Um, No, no, all of them have to be the same. Right. Um, it must be the last argument. You can't only use one. Yes. Uh, so, in that case, you have to use the dot 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 and thing? Yes. And if I have multiple arguments, they're all, all by reference. It's a great example of that in the RSC. I have it on the slides. So, what does this look like? Function, fn, actual defined parameters. This one is optional. Um, so you can put this after optional parameters. 
um, it will default to an empty array if nothing is connected. Um, if you then var dump those values, so we call it with one argument, one for the first one, this is not passed in, so it's null, empty array, pass it in two, one, two, empty array. Then as we start adding arguments, you see that it starts getting added to this array, which is dollar parameter. This is that example. Um, so references. MySQL implements DB. We have this prepare function. Basically, we pass in the query and then we pass in the params as uh, reference. Inside of that, then, we prepare our query and then for every parameter that's passed in, which is done by reference, we for each again by reference to maintain that. And then we bind it. So if you ever use PO with bind param, uh, this allows you to um, basically save this value, this variable, is reference and when you update that variable, it'll update the um, uh, prepared query. Basically when you run it, it'll use the latest version. Um, so statement equals db prepare, here's our uh, query with three uh, question mark uh, placeholders, three variables that we're going to pass in, name, email, and age. Uh, those would be defined beforehand, but we didn't have to in this case. Um, so those are passed in by reference. They're bound again by reference, and then we have this for each users to insert as the list. This is new in 5.4. Um, so basically, this is an array of arrays. Each array contains three uh, values, at least three name, email, and age. So those get assigned to these three variables, which were passed by reference, and then we execute the statement. So what happens is uh, this list updates those reference down parameters and what else? Uh, a little complex, but I, um, I love this as a list. Uh, so, type hints, as I said, uh, they all have to be the same. So in this case, we say pass in a bunch of callbacks, so they must all be callable. It's basically the same as doing for each dollar callbacks, instance of whatever. Um, and here we can call it because we know they're all The flip side of this is argument unpacking, also known as slap. Same syntax, <laughs> triple dot dollar variable, except if you use it when calling a function. And you can use it with any function in PHP. It's not part of the definition, it's part of the call. And what it does is it allows you to take any array like structure, so it could be a real array, it could be some sort of um, SQL array object or something like that, and you can unpack it into the individual parameters for that function. So it's the opposite of variadics. No more call user func array, which is super slow. Yay! Um, it's valid for any argument list, including instantiation of objects. It must be the end thing in the argument list. Uh, this is the same default for that, unlike if you're defining uh, variadics. So what does this look like? Function test, this is a variadic going in. We're going to bar dump it. Test one, two, three, goes into dollar args. Test unpack this array. Again, we get it as three individual arguments, not as an array. Same thing here, we're with an array iterator, so as I said, it's arrays or array-like structures. We're unpacking it, and again, it's passed in as three separate arguments. Um, so if this defined three arguments instead of having a variadic, each one of them would have their respective value from that array. Um, so, you can use them multiple times. Uh, however, they must be on the right of explicitly passed in. Uh, initially, when the RFC passed and was implemented, you could put them on the left, and it would basically fill in as many parameters as it could, and then those would get thrown in on the end. Um, and it took that out, so that's no longer there. Um, I'm kind of bummed about that, but it makes sense, because you don't really know what this is. Uh, you should. Um, so, these are the two ways of using it. Any questions? I'd love to hear questions. I have a whole shit ton of slides if you have any questions about some of the stuff I didn't go into detail on. I'd be happy to talk about it. Yes.
Thank you. 